continued his assault on the leaderboard. Pinkerton ripped through the shoulder to overhead and put himself in third place for the event. We had to make it work for our family. It couldn't just work for me. Uh, it had to work for our family. This is our lifestyle. But it was just the two of us as coaches. From the first day I set foot in a CrossFit gym, it was my dream to start a box of my own. Every free minute you have, you have to have a plan for that day, every day. Steve Pinkerton has actually been to Florida. He was a Marine. There's just something that comes along with a mindset of a Marine. We wanted to be the best coaches possible. I've sacrificed a lot to get here, and it grew really fast, really quick, and that first year was a blur. I couldn't imagine doing it without having both on the same page. Steve Pinkerton dominated the third heat. It was Pinkerton's second straight top three finish. We want to be successful at anything we do. We train together, and we suffer together. That just makes us better at what we can go out and do. There's nothing more satisfying to me than doing something I love at the same time being able to support my family and building a community of like-minded athletes. Ladies and gentlemen, Steve and Jess Pinkerton. That's a cute couple right there. The guy with the beard. <laughs> Listen, my brother and I wanted to do something. I heard uh, Chuck Colson uh, say this. He said, we need to define and always differentiate between what is crucial and what is important. Your pancreatic health is important. Breathing is crucial. So if you're underwater and you can't breathe, you're not worried about whether your pancreas works. You need air. And so David and I were thinking about this conference and we're like, okay, so we need to do something that's a little more outside the box, something that's really going to help folks in this area of crucial. None of the leaderships None of the leadership principles that we outline today and all the stuff that we talk about today is going to matter anything if you can't breathe. It, it won't. So we talk about our spiritual foundation. We talk about all these things that mean so much, and we need to make sure that we focus on those things. But I'm telling you, we've got to take care of these bodies of ours. So David and I wanted, just after lunch, of course, I'm sure you had cookies and chips and those types of things. Steve was back in the other room. He had his own little Tupperware thing of avocado and some other concoction that I was not going to participate in. But, so David and I wanted to make sure that we had two of our closest friends here. They run a CrossFit gym in Concord, and uh, they started it about three years ago, two and a half, three years ago, and it became the fastest growing CrossFit gym, one of the fastest growing in the world. And uh, interesting thing about appetite, since this is all about crate, I walked into CrossFit that, that freezing cold morning in April of 2010, David and I had just gotten off of about two weeks of figuring out how we're going to rebuild the 40-foot retaining wall in the back of our building that fell down because the contractor that built it didn't pour the foundation correctly. So here we are thinking about foundations. And we walk in, and we're thinking, okay, you know, we're professional athletes here. You know, we're going to go and roll this place up. And Steve comes walking up to me, this Goliath Drago. I wanted to yell at him like, Yossi or you know, tell him, you know, why'd you kill Apollo? You shouldn't have done that. <laughs> Gee whiz, you know. So, so he comes walking up, and uh, we shook hands. I said, my goal now is for you to just get me to look like you. If you can do that, then, then you have won. And so we joined CrossFit, and these folks literally have been transforming physical lives, not even realizing that they're transforming lives as well, people's re real lives. And so, uh, and what I've told Steve and uh, Jess, that when you meet the need in business, when you meet the need that the customer and the client is paying you for, at that point, you will see clearly to meet the need that they're not paying you for, if you have the heart of a priest. So CrossFit brings an element of uh, group fitness and, and community that you can't really find in another uh, fitness environment. And today is not our everybody should go to CrossFit. It's more functional fitness and, and nutrition. But it's so important. So what we wanted to focus on with this just short little segment is for one moment, let's put our leadership principles aside and everything else aside. Let's think about our bodies for a second. Let's think, do, how, how long do we want to live? Of course, God is ultimately in control of that. Let's think about how we can take care of our bodies. This is of crucial importance. 
So, of course, my dad would be like, no, nah, it doesn't matter, you know, as he's sucking down his sixth straight fudgicle. So, all right. Let me, let me crank it up right here. Uh, okay, so you've got to love the title of this thing, by the way. I actually came up with that myself. You can't lead if you can't breathe. I'm not thinking about leading if I'm literally underwater and I can't breathe. So I want to talk real quick. Okay, in order of importance, we're going to talk exercise and we're going to talk nutrition but if someone can't exercise or maybe they can't make it should they still eat healthy or should they put exercise over nutrition I mean you see some fat bodies in CrossFit still that can't control their appetites at 1030 at night but yet they'll still be in the gym working out in the morning so um, briefly before you do that though what, Steve you start out just tell us when you started CrossFit why you started CrossFit and then let's talk about the the, the very first question on our you know, I started CrossFit about uh, four years ago, and we were looking for something different. For the longest time, I had been in a routine where Jess and I would go to the gym together. She'd do two hours of cardio work. I'd do two hours of meathead lifting. That didn't make a whole lot of sense, but it was what was in the magazines and was what we grew up doing. And uh, we thought going to, these, going to the gym together would be together time, but it wasn't. I never saw her for the two hours. We'd get in the car and go home. And uh, it just wasn't, uh, it wasn't very fulfilling to me. So we found CrossFit. We tried a few workouts, and uh, I wasn't very good at it. And when I'm not good at something, it, it really it creates an appetite for me to want to get better. And um, so I was hooked, and Jess took a little more time. It was a little bit more out her, outside of her comfort zone. And uh, uh, we did it in our garage for about five months and got people that were crazy enough to come train in a garage with Jess and I. And then we decided to, uh, to make that plunge into CrossFit Vitality. And I think it can go both ways. We talk about meeting a need. We opened, and you have to imagine, I left the Marine Corps for eight years to go open up a gym. And I, t I remember telling my dad, I said, man, dad, I'm gonna leave the Marine Corps after I've just kind of figured out what it is we're doing here and how everything works. I'm gonna go open up a gym I'm going to charge people. It's going to cost more money than what anybody else is paying for a gym membership. I'm not going to have an air conditioning. I'm not going to put heat in there in the winter. And the workouts are going to be harder than anything people's ever experienced. And They're he awful. At, yeah. And he looked at me and said, you're crazy. Are you sure you want to do this? And, um, you know, a lot of people kind of doubted us when we first started. So that, that, that plunge was tough for me. But I remember Jess and I in that gym and seeing Dave and Jason walk in. And they looked at me and they said, hey, we're going to do everything we can to make you successful. And something about the two of them, I mean, you, if, for those of you guys that know Jason and Dave pretty well, there, there's just something about them that, that kind of puts you at ease uh, when they're not making fun of you. So <laughs> He's not at ease at the end of this conversation. <laughs> I've got something in my bag for you, Steve. <laughs> but, um, you know, and they've helped me along the way. They've helped Jess along the way with me and kind of, mentored me in a way that uh, I don't think I'd be in a position where we are today without that type of mentorship and that's just uh, it, it, it's it's been a blessing to us and a blessing to our family so we're we're excited to be here you know uh, talk about finding your sweet spot Ken it, where your greatest passion intersects with your greatest talent that's what he did he did something that totally did not make sense and they're absolutely thriving I want to direct this to Jess Jess in order of importance is diet or exercise more important, or are they the same? Well, it might not be in our best interest being in the fitness industry, but really nutrition is of utmost importance. It would have to trump exercise if we had to pick one or the other. There's a um, quote that says, you cannot out-train a poor diet, and I think that's really relevant. Um, you can work out really hard in the gym every day of the week, and if you go home and eat junk food and processed food and fast food, you're really not going to see the results that you would if you stuck to a healthy diet. And we see that especially in January every year, we hold a paleo challenge at our gym. And um, paleo is a diet that basically um, has people eliminate, gra eliminate grains and dairy, sugar, and processed food from your diet. For, and we do it for six weeks. And we see such a change. I mean, these people, some have been crossfitting for two years. But once they take that six weeks and eliminate the sugar, eliminate the grains and dairy, they see more changes in their body physique, in their energy. They're sleeping better. They're performing better on the job, have more energy with their kids. 
So it's really amazing what that nutrition piece does. And it gives you the energy to want to exercise and to want to go to the gym. And so it's kind of a, a positive cycle. One kind of spurs on the other. So people are eating well, eating healthy, and then they're working out. And it's a great combination. Now she talks all about uh, nutrition is more important. She happens to be the rabbit that Jason and I chase in the gym because it's all CrossFit wads start with these uh, wad workout of the day. All of, it has its own language. They all start with Steve saying, starting in 10. And then we get to three, two, one, and she's out the door, and you've got 15 of us just chasing her down the way. Down the way. She just absolutely kills us in the gym. Uh, Steve, how about exercise? How important is exercise? I think it's kind of a double-edged sword when you try to make a choice between nutrition or, uh, or fitness or exercise. I, I don't think you can have one without the other. You can make the case, and it, Jess and I talk about this all the time, you can have a really good uh, diet, a really uh, nutrition dialed in, which takes, it's hard work. It's hard work to be uh, dialed in with your diet. But if you're, not, if you're leading a sedentary life, you, you, there's really no point to be that disciplined with your diet. So, and the opposite is just as true. You know, working out, doing CrossFit, or doing whatever fitness routine you're doing, anything's better than nothing. But if you're doing that and not eating right, then everything you're, the, the time you're investing into your fitness, which is hard work, now kind of goes, and, and you don't get to reap the benefits of it. You're not really optimizing your body. If you could just, you know, meet somewhere in the middle, do a little bit of exercise, and then fix your diet a little bit. You know, we're not saying you have to be 100% strict paleo and you can't eat sugar. That's not sustainable for anybody, um, but I think you've got to have that balance between the two. You absolutely have to. Teddy Roosevelt once said, I never knew a man who lived a life of ease whose name was worth remembering. In the scripture, Jesus grew in wisdom, in stature, and in favor with God and man. Oftentimes, uh, in the Christian community especially, we forget that whole stature part. So I think stature is incredibly important. So diet and exercise uh, but there's something that's a little bit different, a little bit twisted in the CrossFit community, and it's called functional fitness. I don't know which one wants to explain that, but explain to us functional fitness and why is it important. Functional fitness is basically the ability to carry out everyday tasks with ease. So to be able to do everything from lifting an object from the ground and putting it overhead to carrying your children, if the need be, to carrying groceries in the house, to squatting down, getting up from the floor, um, and CrossFit tries to prepare you for any and all tasks, anything that might come your way, we want you to be able to accomplish with ease. So functional fitness basically covers all those aspects. And I think you can relate this to, we've all been there, for those that work out at the, the, the traditional gyms, if you can give me an example of where a calf raise is you experience that during the day, then I'm a believer, I'll go back to doing them right now, but there's just some movements that just don't make a whole lot of sense. So, you know, I think once you get into that functional fitness realm, you really start to feel your body get to a place that it hasn't been before, and that's because we're, we're outside of our comfort zone, and that's what functional fitness and, 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 and CrossFit tries to get you to, to, to experience that outside the, uh, outside your, your little bubble of comfort zone. And I think the thing that uh, attracted David and I to functional fitness, doing things that are actually functional, because I mean, we got down and did uh, dumbbell bench, or uh, bench press dumbbell, you know, what do we call those? Flies and all that kind of stuff, but I mean, really, when, when do you ever do that kind of stuff? So doing the kind of exercise that's going to help you in your everyday life. So my wife and I work out together, so let me give you a little taste of what it's like, what we do. And if you're CrossFitter in here, you, you'll, you'll be glad that I, I give the taste to the crowd. When we walk in, it's like you're paying for a one-on-one -on -one trainer, but you're doing it in a group setting. So either Steve or Jess or both of them, like they were Wednesday, are together, and we'll have a class of maybe 10 to 12 to 15 people, and you have to sign up for the class. And then they, they basically put you through a stretching routine, a little warm-up, and uh, the warm-up that we do is oftentimes harder than what most folks do. And, and the, the fun thing about CrossFit is that we get to make fun of the folks that walk around with the, the towel on and the headphones and the water bottle and those types of things. But So we get in there together, and we... We do this, and then they have a, a little workout written up on a board. 
So on uh, Monday, our workout was five rounds, five rounds. You have to go through this whole thing. Uh, 20 pull-ups, 30 push-ups, 40 sit-ups, and 50 air squats. You want to show them an air squat? <laughs> and hold, <laughs> an air squat and hold. Okay, now that's one round. And then you go through that five times. And so it, took, it, t it takes most people 35 to 40 minutes to do that. Uh, now, you're thinking, oh, man, that's not for everybody. That you definitely can't do that. But it takes time to work up to that because my wife did the same workout. And she got through it. And there were other folks there that were 200 pounds heavier than me that got through it as well. Because there's always different ways you do it. So, okay, this is kind of a, a, a just off the subject real quick. Not off the subject, but a little different than our question. But... That kind of workout, it does something to your heart rate and, and you're burning calories for longer than you would if you just went out and you ran 20 minutes or whatever. Why is that? Which one of you wants to talk to that? Like, how, how does that help? You know, I think the key to any fitness routine, whether it's uh, something you're doing by yourself or something you're doing in a group, is you want to keep your heart rate as elevated as possible. And what the, the trap that we fall into is we'll do... Uh, you know, maybe a minute or two of work, and then you'll find yourself going to talk to someone in the corner of a gym, or going to get a drink, or uh, you know, there's there's uh, a, a number of reasons why you're going to stop. In CrossFit, for example, we take and we keep that that heart rate elevated, and we try to keep it there for an extended period of time. And w pain is somewhat associated with that most of the time, but it's just you're becoming more comfortable with that elevated heart rate where and we've all done it where we've, we've we've walked up a flight of stairs or 10 flights of stairs and you're like man why am i sweating you know why am i why is my heart rate up it's because you're just not used to that type of exertion so i think we're, you know the key to anything is how high can we get your heart rate and how long can we keep it there so those type of workouts are are so much more painful than your traditional uh buys and tries or chest and back type of workouts where it's slow movement, long rest. Slow movement, long rest. You know, that's why it hurts so much. Uh, and, and we've put our kids in this. And I tell you, the thing that we've seen with our kids is it, it, when they get out there and, and they literally are on the push-up number 30 and they've already done 40 air squats or whatever and, and all that they're doing, it puts them in a position to where they learn how to push through a wall. You see what I'm saying? So, and I've always talked with my wife, if we can control our kids' physical appetites for certain foods, then it will teach them to control their appetites for other things. So if we can teach them physically how to push through a wall, when your heart rate gets up to 150, 160, 170, if, I don't even know if that's a really high heart rate or not, but if, if it gets up there, that is high? Okay. So if it gets way up there, and yet you're, you still have the ability to exert effort and to push forward and to kind of get through that, what we like to say is you get into your pain cave and you get comfortable because you're not coming out. And you've got to go through it and you've got to bust through that and get to the finish line. I've seen things in my kids change because we took them through a workout like this. Now, it's not all just meathead type stuff. So you see Steve on this video and all, but he's the upper echelon of CrossFit. Well... I'm the upper echelon of CrossFit. But Steve is secondary to me, and David is third to Steve. So, but it's, it's, so this functional fitness is awesome. Okay, so we don't have a whole lot of time left. Let's talk about real quick, which one of you wants to talk about, what is it about nutrition that maybe most of us aren't thinking about right now or we don't know? So there's so many misconceptions when it comes to nutrition. For the past three decades, um, Americans have been led to believe that fat is what makes you fat. And then if you go in the grocery store, you see so many fat-free, low-fat, reduced fat, and that's how a lot of us buy our groceries. We're always looking at fat content. But really, your body needs fat for proper brain function and hormonal function. You need the proper types of fat, those monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats that you get from avocado and coconut products and olive oil and nuts. Those are important staples. They should be staples in your diet. Um, really what is causing the obesity epidemic in America is sugar. So um, sugar and carbohydrates are really being stored as body fat when you eat an excess of them. Because your body's very good at storing excess calories as fat. 
years ago, our ancestors didn't know when the, their next meal was coming, so the body became very good at storing for times of famine. Well, fast forward to today and the present, and we don't really have to worry about where our next meal is coming from. There's always a vending machine down the hall with Snickers bar or a fast food restaurant right down the street with everything supersized. But unfortunately, our body is still just as good at storing excess calories. So that's why we see so many overweight Americans. We're eating way too many carbohydrates, way too much sugar, which we're addicted to as a society. So a lot of times it's really not our fault. Um, but that's really what's making us fat. So if we could give you one thing to take home today, it's really try to limit the processed food. Look at the sugar content more than the fat content of foods, really, because that is what's causing type 2 diabetes, uh, all the issues that Americans are having in this huge um, obesity ec epidemic. Okay, I have a quick, real quick, because now you've sparked my interest. Because I love ice cream, and I love orange juice and apple juice. Do you drink orange juice and apple juice in the morning? No. Why? Because it's, it is natural sugar, and there are some vitamins and minerals there, but it's very condensed sugar. Fruit juices have a lot of sugar. It's the same thing with smoothies. Like People are led to believe that you go to the Smoothie King and stuff, and that's such a healthy thing. Well, there is more sugar in those than you need all day long. So yeah, you're you, just storing all the rest as fat. Oh yeah, that you, you only use yeah what you use in the day, what you use through your exercise or carrying out your daily tasks, and everything else is stored as fat. And I think where this really hit home for me, Jess told me a couple weeks ago there's a stat, and I think we all have heard it, but I, I, I just think it really it, it drove the nail home for me is that one out of three kids, one out of three children are overweight or obese in America. And, in America, and that. That to me is um, it's frustrating. I got sharp edges. Jess softens me up, so you know I I, I I lose my patience for that type of stuff because I think uh, we need to do a better job at educating our kids on, on on better choices and setting them up for success in the future. And we're not doing that if uh, if they're one of those three that are overweight and obese because it's not that child's fault. It's really it comes down to us as leaders and, and, and parents. Um, so That's good. Well, that ties into my next question, which is how do you kill cravings for unhealthy food like the cravings that Jason has? <laughs> <laughs> I think we all have cravings. I mean, we can all admit it. Even if we're on the strictest of diets, you're going to at times cave in to cravings, and that's okay. We're all human. But um, I think Steve is the most disciplined person I know when it comes to eating and, and training. So what are your tips? <laughs> yeah. uh, I really think that you have, to, you have to reset your body. So everyone kind of says, how do I do that? It's got to be, you have to take six weeks. I really, I really think everybody should mark on your calendar at some time, at some point, maybe not now between Thanksgiving and Christmas because that would be a very horrible time to try and cut out sugar. But maybe, maybe that's your January. I'm not a big New Year's resolution guy, but you know, maybe January, February, you put in your calendar six weeks and you try and give up your processed foods, your sugar, your dairy, uh, and your grains. And I think if you, can, if you can imagine having a stuffy nose for 20 years, let's say you had a stuffy nose for 20 years, you have no idea what it feels like to be able to breathe through your nose so you consider that stuffy nose normal. Now, one day your nose clears up and you're able to breathe again. You're like, oh my gosh, I don't even know. That, that's amazing. Well, I feel that's what a lot of us have in our stomach, in our gut. We've got a lot of inflammation in there. You take out some of those foods, those, the, the, the dairy and the grains and the sugar, let your body get back to normal where it's, where it's meant to be, and then add those back in and see how you feel. And I tell people all the time, if you do six weeks of paleo and you do not feel better, then never do it again. Shoot me an email and tell me I'm crazy, but it's never happened. Everybody always feels better. And then, and then it's about making it sustainable. Then after those six weeks, you sprinkle some of those things back in. Some people like to have almond butter and chocolate chips every night. They shoot me emails and texts about it. That's fine, have that, it makes it sustainable. But at least you're making, you're conscious of those decisions and you realize there's a consequence to what you put in your body. Whereas now, you don't really know the difference of 
okay, I had a big pasta meal before, it didn't really affect me. Now you get all that grain out of your system, you have that same pasta meal, and you're like, oh my gosh, what is, what's going on? Why is my stomach so messed up? You know, you just gotta, you've got to have the discipline and the desire to, to, to set your body back up for success. Jess, do we need to absolutely, like Steve, he says he's got rough edges or sharp edges, very much so. Do we absolutely have to hit paleo, no breads, no grains, no sugar, or can there be some modifications and then enter into a paleo type of a diet? Of course. I mean, anything is better than nothing. So if you can just cut out the processed stuff. If, I like mean, if what it's in specifically? A, if it's in a package and it's been on the shelf for like a month and you still think it's good and edible, it's probably not good for you. So try to stick with natural foods, things that grew from the ground or animal products. You know, just try to eliminate anything with a high amount of sugar. I mean, that's not to say on the weekends you can't have ice cream, you know, with your kids or something. You always have to not totally get rid of those things that bring you a higher quality of life. But after a while, you start you stop craving them as much if you're not eating as much. Okay, so it's kind of like a vicious cycle. The more you eat, the more you crave. The less you eat, the less you crave. And you start noticing the natural sweetness of things like fruits that, that didn't, like your taste buds were kind of dull um, because you had been eating so much concentrated sugar. And fruits, again, begin to uh, taste really sweet, especially for kids. It's a great idea um, to try to substitute fruits for some of those treats that they want after meals. So you can take it, you know, whatever level that is feasible for you. Um, if you do six weeks of strict paleo, it's harder in the beginning, but it's easier afterward. You know. Yeah, when you were, when Jess was explaining to me before I took the paleo challenge, she said, the first two weeks, you're going to be shaking a little bit, and your head's going to be hurting, and you're not going to want to work out. Well, that was true. It was awful. It was it's, just sugar's terrible. a drug. We are addicted to sugar, so it's like coming down from a high. You're craving those things, and you're, you get headaches, and it's immediately taken away. If you were to go have a Snickers bar or something, you'd feel completely better. So we're, we're stuck in that rut. There was a study, one of my favorite studies, they took a dozen rats and they put them in this enormous cage with a, with a maze in the, on, in the middle and on two ends there were droppers for food. And they fed these rats but the, uh, in one dropper they had liquid cocaine and they let these rats for 14 days, two weeks, get addicted to this liquid cocaine and they stayed all on one side of the maze. That's all, they just huddled right there by the, by the dropper. On the 15th day, they led each one through the maze to the other side, and there was the same dropper, but it had sugar water in it. Within 24 hours, and then they led all the rats back to the other side. Within 24 hours, all 12 of those rats were back at the sugar water, and they never left it. So my point is, I think sugar is extremely addictive and dangerous drug, but it's just not really one that's talked about as much uh, you know, in society, and that's the cause behind all of this obesity that we're, we're seeing. Well, you're sitting up here with a couple of rats <laughs> in, a, in a room full of rats. What if, for those, of those that are not motivated, are there anything that, that they can do to, to motivate themselves to start eating healthy and exercising? I think you've got to relate it to your kids. You know, you've got to relate it to yourself and say, okay, I want to be there longer for my kids. And um, if, if you don't take care of what God gave you as a body to, to do those things, then you know, I think you're doing yourself and, and, and your family a disservice. I think that's the motivation. If you ever needed any, you, know, you want to be that guy that's out there that's able to run around with their kids when they're in high school. You know? um, I'll never forget it. My dad, when we would go out and play catch, we had to, I had to stand like five feet away from him. He'd throw the football and... You know, he had a bad shoulder. He didn't really take care of his body. And, you know, you don't want to be, you don't want to be limited by your health, you know, because 60, 70 years old, it, sh it's, it shouldn't be something that we're, we're all sitting like, man, that's, that's old. I, I just don't see it that way anymore. If we take care of the body we have, and that should be your motivation in, in, in my eyes. Absolutely. You want to say anything to that, Jess? No, I just think an external, if you cannot find it internally to motivate yourself, 
think about those who love you, the external motivation, your kids. You are an example for your kids, and they do. They look up to you, even if you don't have kids, other kids in the neighborhood or nieces and nephews. I mean, they see what we do and want to to be like us. So we love, we have a a child watch at the gym and we have a window where the kids can look out and watch and and see their parents. And they'll be standing there cheering them on. And after the workout, they run out and try to imitate the movements themselves. So I think it's it's really good to get that external motivation if you can't find it within yourself. Although my little two-year-old, it's not much cheering. She's like, (laughs) get me out of here. Let me wrap up with this. Action precedes motivation. This morning, when I opened my eyes, I did not want to get out of bed. I didn't. I wanted to stay in bed, but I I forced myself to get up. I knew we had to get here and get prepared and all that type of stuff. Jumped in the shower, jumped out, and by that point, I was up. I was completely, I was as awake as I could possibly be. My action led my motivation. And like what they were saying, too, when you shove sugar into your mouth, you crave more of it. It's just the way it works. Stephen and Alex Kendrick would say in their book, The Love Dare, it's your responsibility not to follow your heart, but to lead your heart. So you lead it, and you have a responsibility to lead it. So as it relates to nutrition and fitness, I would say act first, and then in time, motivation will begin to catch up, and then you will feel motivated. So anyway, thank you guys for being on. This was awesome. I learned a lot. I know you guys all learned a lot.